Hello everyone, Dr. Polaris here. Before we get to the Miko Sukaians, I'd just like to say a few words about what's happened, uh, well, what's been happening to my channel recently. Um, as many of you probably already know, um, last week my channel was hacked um, by some cryptocurrency promoting people and they started broadcasting live streams on my channel, um, which of course got the alert out that <laughs> it wasn't me doing that. So the channel was quickly shut down by YouTube. Uh, well, I've been spending the last week or so trying to get my channel back, and uh, now it's finally <laughs> succeeded. Uh, YouTube were actually really great. Um, I'd like to thank them for really for getting back to me so quickly and getting my channel back within just seven days, which surprised me. I've because I've heard so many horror stories about this of people not be able to get their channels back after it was hacked. So. Yeah, I'm, and I'm also really, really grateful and touched by the number of people who reached out to me on social media, thanking me for what I do and saying how much they, they really love and appreciate these videos. It means so much to me, honestly, to hear people say that. And I'm so, so grateful to have such a, a wonderful audience for these pretty obscure and kind of niche topics that I cover most of the time. So I'd just like to say another thank you to you guys. I couldn't, I couldn't do this without you. And thank you especially to all my patrons, as that as the numbers on there have shot up so quickly and in such a short time. I'm just so so grateful for all of you, and um, yeah, I hope I hope we can get the channel back up and running and as successful as ever with some new videos. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, back to the content of the video now. The continent of Australia is strongly associated with dangerous animals, with one of the most notorious examples being the often enormous and intimidating saltwater crocodile, made famous overseas by the exploits of Steve Irwin. Along with the smaller and mostly piscivorous freshwater crocodile, or freshy, these two species represent the only crocodilians present in modern Australia, and have ranges that are limited to the northern coastal regions of the country. This is because the ancestors of the Freshies and Salties only arrived in Australia relatively recently, during the Pliocene and Pleistocene respectively. Before this time, the land down under was home to its own unique and diverse radiation of crocodilians, the Mycosuchines. These animals first appear in the fossil record during the early Eocene, and have mostly been recovered as a natural grouping. Despite inhabiting a wide range of ecological niches, the Mycosuchines have a number of consistent traits, including a fairly conservative hip morphology and straighter humeri than modern crocodiles, which may indicate better adaptations for terrestrial locomotion. However, this does not mean that these reptiles were entirely terrestrial, like many of the Cretaceous Notosuchians. In addition, phylogenetic studies have placed the Mycosuchines in various places within the clade Crocodilia, meaning that they are at least a part of the group that contains modern alligators, gharials and crocodiles. Generally, they have been considered to be either the sister group to Crocodilidae, or as more basal members of the Longirostres, predating the Garial and Crocodile divergence. However, they have also been considered to be related to the clade Orientella Sukina, another mysterious group of extinct crocodilians from the late Cretaceous to the late Eocene of East and Southeast Asia. <laughs> Seriously, arguments about the classification of these extinct crocodilians change just as much as debates around the swimming ability of Spinosaurus, or the exact size and body proportions of Atodus megalodon. Regardless of their exact placement within crocodilia, the oldest known Mycosuchine was the genus Cambara, from the Eocene-aged Mergon fossil-bearing deposits in Queensland, Australia. Known from four different species, it was a medium-sized crocodilian that measured between 3 and 4 metres, or up to 13 feet long. The skull was flattened, which, when combined with the warm swampy habitat in which it lived, indicate that Cambara was a semi-aquatic ambush predator. However, like many Mycosuchines, it was also fairly capable on land, perhaps somewhat like the living Cuban crocodile. The different species filled varying ecological niches hunting a variety of marsupials, soft-shelled turtles, and lungfish. Unsurprisingly, given its age, with the oldest specimens dating to roughly 54 million years ago, this genus is often placed as one of the most basal Mycosuchines. Another fairly basal form was Australosuchus, from the late Oligocene and early Miocene of southern Australia. It was broadly comparable to Cambara in size, being about 3 metres or 10 feet long, and was also a generalist semi-aquatic ambush hunter. 
Interestingly, this animal possessed the most southern distribution of all Australian Mikosukines, being the only crocodilian found in Australia below 27 degrees south. This is odd, as the contemporary Riversley fossil region of Queensland further to the north possessed a diverse community of crocodilians. This probably means that Australosuchus was a relatively cold tolerant animal, like the modern American alligator, as southern Australia at this time was warm temperate with cool winters. As both Cambara and Australosuchus possessed platyrostral skulls and were basal members of the group, this suggests that the common ancestor of all Mikosukines were generalist carnivores as well. The much later genus Calthifrons, from the Pliocene of the Lake Eyre Basin in South Australia, was generally similar in both size and niche. This lifestyle may have helped this genus to survive beyond the late Miocene which otherwise saw a notable decline in Mikosukine diversity as a result of the aridification of Australia at this time. Calthifrons lived in the lakes and billabongs of a semi-arid floodplain, alongside the still-living gulf-snapping turtle, whose range is now restricted to northern Australia. The holotype specimen has been dated to about 3.9 million years ago in the upper Tirari formation, although notably its remains are completely absent from the younger Pompelopelina member of the formation, with an indeterminate species of the modern genus Crocodilus taking over its ecological niche. Based on the dating of this member, true crocodiles entered the Lake Eyre Basin during the Middle Pliocene about 3.9 to 3.4 million years ago, possibly overlapping with the range of Calthifrons. The appearance of the genus Crocodilus in Australia, likely after having migrated there via the Malay archipelago, would have come at a crucial point in the history of Mikosukines. Though highly successful during the Oligocene and Miocene, the group appears to have experienced a major faunal turnover leading into the Pliocene, with much of the Miocene diversity going extinct after what was likely a brief period of especially intense aridity. While Mikosukines managed to bounce back after conditions briefly became wetter again, the case of the Tirari crocodilus species represents the first sign of crocodiloids replacing Mikosukines. However, it is currently unknown if Calthifrons was outcompeted by crocodiles or became extinct before their arrival. Meanwhile, in more recent studies of Mikosukine evolution, a clade of more derived short snouted forms has been found, with the most basal member probably being the genus Ultrastenos. Inhabiting the late Oligocene forests at Riversley, this small animal measured just 1.5 metres, or about 4 feet 11 inches long, originally thought to have been the long-snouted, gharial-like form. Later discoveries of more complete skull material found that the snout was quite short and flattened. It may have lived somewhat like the modern freshwater crocodile, feeding on fish, amphibians and small mammals, with its small size allowing the genus to avoid competition with the several larger species of crocodilians with which it shared its environment. One of these was a similarly small and fairly closely related Mikosuchus, which also first appears at the late Oligocene deposits at Riversley. The species present here was M. white hunterensis, which was a more terrestrial carnivore that possessed a skull similar in shape to that of the South American Sebecosuchians. Its rear teeth were blade-like, being well adapted for stripping flesh from its prey. The eyes were also positioned on the sides of the skull and not at the top as in semi-aquatic crocodilians, also indicating terrestrial habits. Given the small size of the holotype skull, this species may have measured just 60 centimetres or about 24 inches long. A slightly later species, M. sanderi, was present in early Miocene deposits at Riversley, after which point Mikosuchus seems to have vanished from the Australian mainland. However, at some point in time after this, the genus was able to swim or raft their way into the Pacific Ocean, landing on New Caledonia and Vanuatu. These island forms persisted into the Holocene, potentially as recently as 3,000 years ago, while even younger dates are also possible. The species from Vanuatu is poorly understood, while the New Caledonian M. inexpectatus may have been about 2 metres or just over 6 feet long and possessed bulbous crushing teeth at the back of the jaws. The snout was very short, with this species probably feeding on snails and crustaceans, being somewhat similar to the modern African dwarf crocodiles. These insular forms possibly died out not long after the arrival of humans, although this is very difficult to prove definitively. Another short-snouted form, Trilophosuchus, was found at Oligomyocene Riversley, and may have lived a fairly similar terrestrial lifestyle, 
searching for hard-shelled prey with its large round eyes. Another close relative, Volia, was endemic to Fiji and was the largest predator native to the islands, potentially being up to 10 feet long and hunting the similarly endemic flightless pigeons and giant iguanas present there during the Pleistocene. Another distinctive lineage within Mikosukine consisted of large forms with broad, powerfully built skulls. The earliest of these was the genus Baru, the so-called cleaver-headed crocodile. Found across central and northern Australia for an astonishing 20 million years, spanning from the late Oligocene to the late Miocene, this beefy predator measured up to 4 metres or 13 feet long. Over this span of time, three species are known, which became progressively more robust as time went on. The eyes were relatively small and located at the top of the skull, which, when combined with animals' stout teeth, indicate a semi-aquatic ambush hunting niche and a preference for large prey. The jaws were capable of delivering devastating bites, with the skull acting like a cleaver to slice through the hides of large marsupials and flightless birds. Unlike in modern crocodiles, the teeth were serrated and therefore capable of causing a great degree of blood loss. Potential targets of this formidable predator would have included big diprotodontians such as Neohelos and Silver Bestius, in addition to Dromornithid birds. Despite its success, Baru became extinct during the late Miocene about 8 million years ago, probably as a result of a period of intense aridification that took hold in Australia at this time. Most of the diverse array of oligomyocene forms also vanished, leaving only a few genera to persist into the Pliocene. One of these was Paludirex, the Swamp King. This genus, with its very broad skull and large body size, filled a similar ecological niche to the modern Australian saltwater crocodile during the Pliocene and Pleistocene, at which point those animals were more restricted to the coastal areas. Native to the northern half of Australia, two species are known, with the older and larger one being Paludirex vincenti. Averaging about 5 metres or 16 feet long, it was comparable in size to the largest modern crocodile species, and, given its upward-facing eyes and nostrils, probably shared a similar semi-aquatic lifestyle. Its skull shared similarities with the Indian mugger crocodile, indicating a non-fussy diet made up of anything that the predator could catch in its jaws, from fish to large marsupials. P. vincenti is known from Pliocene and probably also Pleistocene deposits, while the later and smaller P. gracilis persisted into the late Pleistocene, surviving as recently as 12,000 years ago. In the Pliocene, it lived alongside other Mycosukines and the long-snouted gavialloid Gunga Morandu, while in the Pleistocene it coexisted with the still-living freshwater crocodile. Like almost all of Australia's megafauna, Paludirex died out during the late Pleistocene, probably as a result of intense aridification, reducing suitable wetland habitats. Another Mycosukine genus that lived alongside Paludirex as one of the last members of the group from the Australian mainland was the famous yet poorly understood Quincana. This interesting animal was clearly successful, persisting from the late Oligocene to the late Pleistocene and producing up to four species. It is famous for possessing blade-like xiphodont teeth and a deep, tall skull, superficially similar to those of Sibekasukians, although these traits are far more poorly developed in the most basal species from the Oligocene. Due to the incompleteness of its remains, with postcranial elements being either unknown or of dubious origins, it is also uncertain what sort of hunting niche this animal inhabited. Traditionally regarded as a fully terrestrial predator, there is currently very little evidence to support this. While Mycosukine fossils from Pleistocene Australia do come from forms that were probably terrestrial, with erect, pillar-like limbs, these have not been formally described and may belong to a different genus. Remains of Quincana are also strongly associated with freshwater habitats, indicating that it still lived close to creeks and billabongs. Perhaps like the modern Cuban crocodile, Quincana was capable of hunting in rivers and on land, being able to gallop at high speed over short distances. The largest individuals could reach lengths of about 3 metres or 10 feet, although apparently undescribed material exists that indicates far larger sizes of 6 to 7 metres. Although older studies claim that Pleistocene Australia was ruled by reptilian predators like Quincana, this is no longer thought to be the case with the remains of this animal being significantly rarer than those of Phylacoleo, for example. Whatever its lifestyle was, Quincana was a capable ambush predator, 
lurking either in the water or in the undergrowth along game trails, before pouncing and tearing chunks of flesh with its serrated teeth. Although the genus survived the downturn in Mikosukine diversity during the late Miocene, it perished during the late Pleistocene, probably about 10,000 years ago. However, its decline began roughly 48,000 years ago, with the intense aridification seriously impacting Australia's river systems, as well as more frequent and intense wildfires. Sadly, this period saw the demise of the Mikosukines in Australia, although, as mentioned earlier, members of this group survived into the Holocene in New Caledonia and Vanuatu. It's such a shame that they didn't persist for just a few thousand years longer. Very scrappy Miocene age remains from New Zealand may also suggest that these crocodilians made it even further into the Pacific. Thanks for watching, everyone. The next episode will be covering some of the lesser known extinction events that occurred during the Mesozoic, such as the Tithonian extinction event and the alleged sauropod hiatus in late Cretaceous North America. Once again, thank you all so much for your support, and if you want to help me out, feel free to head over to my Patreon, where you can get my videos early and without any ads. See you again soon. Cheerio!